You are about to experience a training program that has changed the lives of hundreds of people. From coast to coast and around the world, people are learning how to program themselves for success. Indeed, if you're not taking a few minutes each day to use the techniques presented in this program, you are missing the most powerful transformational techniques ever discussed. Your speaker is Dr. Alan Zimmerman. From overcoming a crippling illness to triumphing over personal tragedy, Dr. Zimmerman now stands as a CSP, or Certified Speaking Professional. This honor places him in the top 5% of all speakers across the United States. More specifically, Dr. Zimmerman comes with a vast array of experience. His background includes bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees in speech communication, sociology, and psychology. He spent 15 years as a university professor and was selected as the outstanding faculty member by two different universities. In addition to his academic career, Dr. Zimmerman has worked in retail sales, recreation management, radio broadcasting, prison therapy, and is president of his own consulting company. Today, Dr. Zimmerman is a full-time speaker, delivering more than 150 programs a year. He has spoken to more than a million people on such topics as motivation, self-esteem, change, and working relationships. His clients include the big and small, the Fortune 500, the public and private, and organizations as diverse as IBM, 3M, Prudential, and the U.S. Air Force. To get the most out of this program, you're encouraged to watch the videotapes over and over. Repetition is a great teacher. You'll see and hear new things each time you play the tapes. More importantly, you need to get involved with the material. Stop the tape when indicated. Read the workbook. Do the exercises in the workbook. And of course, practice the techniques presented in this program. If you'll practice these techniques on a daily basis, you'll be amazed at the success you'll achieve. Welcome to Programming Yourself for Success. And now, Dr. Alan Zimmerman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm reminded of this preacher who was trying to build a new church. He gave all kinds of sermons about giving money, but people just weren't giving the money. So he thought to himself, uh, come Sunday morning, when I ask him to stand and make a commitment, they will stand. Uh, he was sure of that because he went to the church on Saturday afternoon and, and wired up all the pews with hot electricity. And he knew where the generous ones sat, where the cheap ones sat, hid the wires underneath the pulpit or underneath the pews. He was bringing the buttons up behind the pulpit, giving a sermon Sunday morning, he said, as you know, I uh, want to raise money for a new church. I want to ask you a very important question this morning. All of you willing to give $100, would you please stand right now? And he pushed the buttons behind the pulpit, the juice under the people, and they jumped, and he said, oh, hallelujah. But it's a more important question. Uh, how many willing to give $500, would you please stand? And he pushed the buttons, they jumped again, and he said, praise the Lord. But the most important question, he said, uh, how many willing to give a thousand dollars, would you please stand? And he threw the master switch and electrocuted the whole congregation. <laughs> that some people will not be moved no matter what. I don't want to try to electrocute you today, but give you one idea that I find electrifying. That people can do amazing kinds of things if they have their mind working for them instead of against them. Hopefully one electrifying idea. I want to give you a sentence. And the sentence simply is, you were born to win but conditioned to fail. Born to win. What I mean by that is I don't believe God creates anybody to be a loser. That we're brought down here to find some success, find some joy, achieve something. We're born to win, but often conditioned to fail. And by conditioned to fail, I don't mean we're failures, we're losers, but we're conditioned not to use our full potential. If you've read any psychology at all, you know that the average person uses five or 10% of their ability. We keep asking ourselves, why don't they use all of it? Why aren't people using all that ability? I want to suggest today how the mind gets conditioned to fail and how you reprogram for success. Let me ask you this. How many here have been to a circus? Just raise your hands. Okay. Have you been the old-fashioned type with a tent? Been to a tent circus? Aren't too many of those around these days. If you've been to a tent circus, you might have noticed a few moments before the performance Outside the tent will be these large bull elephants waiting to perform. 
around the leg of the elephant you would find a little rope going to a stake in the ground. And if you thought about that rope, that elephant, what would you realize? What? Man, not going to hold him. That he's so powerful to pick up his foot and walk away, but they condition him to fail. I have to know that. My great aunt, her name was Ella Mills. You ever hear of Baraboo, Wisconsin? A place called Circus World Museum. It's where the Ringling Brothers Circus actually started. Well, Ella Mills, my great aunt, was the fat lady at that circus for 42 years. True story. She was 650 pounds, 5 foot 2. Yes. Came to all our family reunions when I was a kid, and I was impressed. Most interesting person ever met in my life. <laughs> and she was all carny. She'd have a thousand tassels on her dress and a big feather in her hair. She'd kind of waddle as she walked down the street. <laughs> now, we think that's inappropriate today to display ourselves, but that's how she made a living years ago. Ella would tell me how they conditioned the elephants to fail. They would take a newborn elephant, moment of birth, that they want to use years later in performance. They put a great big chain around the leg of the elephant, chain went to a big stake in the ground, and hours, days, weeks of tugging, taught him he was never going to get loose. When he stopped trying, now the smallest rope contains him. He's born to win, but conditioned to fail. Something similar happens to people. We're given great potential, but something happens to make us think, well, I can't do this, I'm no good at that. Get conditioned to fail. In a similar way, have you been to San Diego, anybody? A place called Balboa Park. In the middle of the park, a great big, aquari big aquarium. Fish from all across the world. In one tank, a savage barracuda with a Spanish mackerel. Now, the barracuda would love to eat the mackerel, but they conditioned him to fail. They put a glass partition between the two fish in the same tank, and over and over again, that barracuda would take a dive, take a dive, take a dive, try to get over eat the mackerel. Whenever he took a dive, what happened? Yes, smashed the glass, smashed his nose, smashed his nose. And finally thought to himself one day, this doesn't feel good. So he changed his behavior. He swam up to the glass, happened to be, swim back. Swim up to the glass, happened to be, swim back. But this is the interesting thing. They've taken the glass partition out. He swims where he thinks the glass is, swims back. Where he thinks it is, swims back. No barrier except his own mind. Again, he's born to win, but conditioned to fail. Something happens to people along those lines. Again, I want to suggest today, how do we get conditioned to fail, and how do you reprogram for success? Now, right now, I'd like you to create an imaginary column of items. I'm going to stack a whole bunch of things on top of each other. All I want you to do is to listen carefully and put a picture in your mind of each of the things I describe. I'll ask you periodically, do you have a picture? And if you do, say yes. If it's not clear, say no, I'll redescribe it. But you listen carefully, visualize here each of the things I describe. Okay? Now imagine right now on the floor we have a long stemmed red rose lying there on the ro floor. Beautiful long stemmed red rose. Put a picture in mind of a long stemmed red rose. If you can imagine that, say yes, please. Yes. Good. Now that rose should have a big, beautiful, bright blossom. But this rose is smashed down. On top of the rose is a great big bar of taffy. Salt water taffy, the kind of candy you chew and chew and chew. The rose is smashed down with that taffy. Can you imagine that? Say yes. yes. Now, right there in the middle of that sticky bar of taffy is a tennis ball. One of the main manufacturers of tennis balls is Wilson. Say Wilson. Wilson. So the Wilson tennis ball is stuck to that taffy. On top of the Wilson tennis ball is a hard ring. It's about this size, size of a hula hoop. This hard ring is on top of which tennis ball again? Wilson, Wilson right. Now, that hard ring, on top of that is a person seated, trying to balance. Hard to balance on top of the hard ring. It's a special kind of person. About 150 years ago, brought from China, people make our railway tracks. We called them something. It wasn't very nice. They were called coolies, right. This Chinese coolie is on top of the hard ring trying to balance. Now, it's hard for him to balance because on his back is the Hoover Dam out there in Nevada. Great big dam. It's on his back. The water's coming down like this, pushing aside the water. Now, our column's getting very high. You look way on top of the Hoover Dam. On top of the dam, you happen to see four roses. There's a rose there, there, here, here. Four roses, rectangular position. How many roses? Four. On top of which dam? Four. Good. Now, if you look at those four roses, kneeling on those roses is a man. He's got a hand on that rose, hand there, knee here, knee here, down all fours. Now, this man that's kneeling on the roses is not some kind of a wimp. We call him a true man. Say, true man. True man. And you know he's a true man because on his back is the Eiffel Tower over in Paris. Come strong and hold that up. Say, Eiffel Tower. 
Now that Eiffel Tower, which is on the true man's back, look on top of the Eiffel Tower and you see a child's wading pool. You know, the kind the kitties blow up in the backyard. Key thing to remember, it's knee deep, say knee deep. Knee now touch your knee and say knee deep. Knee so we got the knee deep pool on top of which tower? Eiffel, Eiffel Tower. Now in that knee deep wading pool is a can of Johnson's Wax. You know, one of these round cans that you polish your furniture with. Uh, the Johnson's Wax, the cover's been taken off. Nestled there in the crevice or the indentation of the Johnson's Wax is the sun. What happens to the wax? Yeah. Melts, right. You say to yourself, gee, the sun should be bright and beautiful. But this sun has got some nicks in it. It's a nicked up sun. Say nicked up sun. Nicked up sun. Strange looking thing. We look way on top of the nicked up sun. And you see parked on top of that sun is a car. What happens to the tires of that car? Melt. Melt. Yeah, burning, stinky, rubber. You say, huh. Well, what kind of car is it? You look carefully. Oh, it's a Ford. Say Ford. Ford. Now that Ford automobile has a sunroof that's been opened up. Stuck in the sunroof, half in, half out is a wooden cart. In some parts of the world, they bring donkeys to bring carts to market. Say cart. Car. Carts inside what kind of car again? Ford. The Ford. If you look in the cart, it's filled with old rags. Rags you might use for cleaning paint and turpentine. Just say rags. rags. Growing out of those rags, now it's a great big tall bush, the size of a Christmas tree. It's a tall bush. Say bush. And this bush has the weirdest decorations. Great big balls of white lint all over. That's the decoration. Say lint. lint. Okay, let's make sure you have all these things. <laughs> let's go back to the bottom of our pile. We have the long-stemmed, smashed down by the salt water, taffy. taffy. Top of the taffy, we had a tennis ball. It was a Wilson. Top of that was a hard ring. Top of the hard ring was a Chinese coolie trying to balance his back the Hoover Dam. On top of the dam, we had four roses. Kneeling there was a true man. On his back was the... Eiffel Tower. Top of the tower was a child's wading pool. It was knee deep. Floating in the pool was the Johnson's wax. Nestled in the crevice of the wax was the sun. What was wrong with the sun? Nicked up sun, right. Top of the sun we had a car. It was a Ford. It stuck in the sun roof, a cart filled with old rags. Growing up, that was a great big tall with decorations of good, good. Let's see if you have those things inside your mind right now. Take the next 30 seconds, please, and just see if you can list to yourself all those things from the Rows at the bottom to the lint at the top. So just think for a moment right now. What you might do as you're listing those things is just kind of number them off. How many fingers? See what total you get. Let's just check it out together. Test yourself in a sense. Score yourself like back in school. We'll say them together and you can just kind of count off on your fingers how many you might have correct. On the bottom we had the long-stemmed Rose smashed down by the taffy. Top of that was the Wilson tennis ball. Top of that was the hard ring. Top of the ring was a coolie. On his back, the Hoover Dam. Top of the dam, we had four roses. Kneeling there, a true man. Top of the man's back was the Eiffel Tower. Top of the tower, we had the yeah, waiting pool, and it was knee deep. Right, floating there was Johnson's wax. In the wax, we had the nicked up sun. Top of the sun was the Ford car. Stuck in the sunroof, the cart filled with old Rags. growing out of that was a big tall bush decorated with balls of lint how many got most or all of them right great great <laughs> if you were in my college classroom a few years ago you would have gotten an a on that test and you say what's the point here i gave you a sentence a moment ago that you're born to win conditioned to fail if i'd asked you three four minutes ago can you memorize all the presidents of the 20th century in the order of their presidency in two minutes. You might have said, oh, no, I can't do that. I don't have a good memory. Most of you just did it. For example, the first president, 20th century, was Teddy Rose who? Roosevelt. After Roosevelt, we had Taffy or Taft. After Taft came Woodrow Wilson. After Wilson, we had Hardring or Harding. After Harding came Cooley or Coolidge. After Coolidge came Hoover, right? And after Hoover, we had Franklin Rose Roosevelt. Why four roses? Four terms in office, yes. And after Roosevelt, we had Truman or Truman. Eiffel Tower sounds like Eisenhower. Then Kennedy or Knee Deep. After Kennedy, we had Johnson. Nicked up son reminds you of Nixon, poor fellow. <laughs> after Nixon, we had... Ford, cart sounds like Carter, rags like Reagan. Of course, then we had Bush, and lint sounds like Clinton. 
And again, I looked at my college students some years ago, and they'd spend two, three hours or two, three evenings memorizing junk like that. You can do it in two minutes if you know how to use your mind. This mind here perhaps is the greatest thing you've been given outside your soul, but it's totally worthless if you don't know how to use it. We put our kids through K through 12, 13 years of school, give them four years of college, that's 17 years total. In those 17 years, most of our kids will not get one single hour of training in how to use their mind. They give them facts, dates, numbers, theories, procedures, but nobody tells them how to use it. That's like buying the best computer in the business. It might be a marvelous piece of machinery, but totally worthless if you don't know how to use it. I said, we're born to win, conditioned to fail. Again, people might say, well, I can't memorize, can't use the mind. If you know how to use it, you can achieve incredible results. I said, born to win. I want to look at how our mind again gets conditioned. I would suggest that every living creature instinctively knows what it has to do to survive. And for example, it gets to be cold outside, and the ducks begin to do what? They fly south. Now, there's no such thing as duck school that says November 15th, get out of here. <laughs> instinctively, no, have to move. Or it gets to be cold, and the squirrels begin to gather what? Nuts. Again, they instinctively know got to do it. We're similar in the sense that we you know when we're hungry, when we're sleepy, we have instincts. Uh, the catch is we're human beings. Nobody here would be satisfied with a little tent to sleep in and a pot of oatmeal to eat once in a while. We have much bigger needs for human beings. In particular, we have a need for self-esteem, decent relationships, and achievement in life. But the catch is nobody was born knowing how to satisfy those needs. You were not born having 15 points of self-esteem or 28 points of self-esteem. You were born empty, neutral, blank. Nobody was born knowing how to achieve anything in life. And nobody was born knowing how to make a great relationship. You're born with these great big needs, but no idea how to satisfy them. Well, your mind doesn't stay empty very long. Over time, your mind gets programmed. There's a little two-step process, what I call repeated viewing, repeated verbalizing, a little principle. That simply means, what did you hear over and over again when you were growing up? If you heard your parents say a thousand times, you're a dumbbell, you're a dumbbell, you're a dumbbell. One day you might have a nice job somewhere, nice house, nice car, and the whole world thinks, oh, gee, she's a success, he's successful. But there might be days when you still feel like dumbbell, dumbbell. Those old tapes come back. There's a best-selling book called The Imposter Phenomenon. The subtitle says, if I'm so successful, then why don't I feel that way? It says 80% of professional people that achieve some success still feel lousy inside. What did they hear over and over again? I spent two years as a prison therapist. and. One of our counselors, Bob Brown, did some very interesting research, found out that 90% of all the prisoners in this country were told by their parents repeatedly when they're growing up, you're going to jail someday, kid. And the amazing thing is they grew up not to disappoint their parents, doing exactly what they were trained to do. What did you hear or repeated viewing? What did you see? If you never saw your parents, for example, have healthy conflict resolution, they just stormed around the house, slammed a door, cussed a bit, Maybe a day you struggle with temper. If you never saw your parents share their feelings, they stuffed all their feelings, got sick instead. Maybe you stuffed way too many feelings for your own emotional and physical health. If you never saw your parents do some hugs and kisses, show some affection, maybe a day you say, well, I'm not the touchy-feely type. I don't go for that mushing around the house. Baloney. Research has been proving over and over again that everybody needs non-sexual touch. But if you never saw it, never got it, it's hard to feel comfortable with that. Repeated viewing, repeated verbalizing. I said a little two-step process by how the mind gets conditioned. First step is you're exposed to people's words, behaviors, and secondly, you adopt. Let's talk about that first one, exposure. I would say that it's tough, very difficult in American society to have continual success because our society is a negative one. 
And this is not a put down of the United States. I've been in many parts of the world. I'll be working next week in Amsterdam and London. And if someone said, Al, where's the greatest place in the world? I'd say right here, U.S., great country. But even though we might be the best country in the world, I think we're a very negative society. And if you don't believe it, for one day, take on a job like mine. Be a communication consultant. And listen to every single person around you speak. Listen to all your coworkers, bosses, customers, subordinates. Listen to husbands, wives, radio, television. And one day, keep a record. How much what you hear is inspirational, motivational, pumps you up, makes you feel fantastic. And how much is whining, griping, groaning, complaining? And maybe you're going to see more negative comments than positive. I was at a workshop a while ago. I was out in the audience, as you are. A lady up here was doing the workshop. Gave a great definition of whining people. She said, whining is anger coming through too small of a hole. <laughs> I thought, yeah, that describes some people. <laughs> we live in this negative society. In fact, right across town, one of these major corporations did an amazing study a while ago. They want to find out how do people talk in the average workplace in America. Went to all these corporations, listened to people talk, and they came to two devastating conclusions. The first one, it takes seven compliments to overcome the effect of one piece of negative feedback. You think about it. You get criticized once, it takes seven compliments to overcome it. Let's say you go over here, and your name is? Marianne. Marianne. And I say, Marianne, I'm curious. Where did you get this disgusting looking outfit? <laughs> you're, you're, you're wondering, too, took a good look, didn't you? <laughs> Now, Marianne, you know I'm teasing. Of course, you look great. That's one. <laughs> but if she thought I meant that, which I didn't, that's two. <laughs> but if you thought I meant that, probably you wouldn't feel good about me embarrassing you, right? Right. Or, or maybe you wouldn't feel good about the outfit. True? True. In fact, do you ever buy some new piece of clothing you wore it for the first time, and someone says to you, where'd you get that? <laughs> and for a long time afterwards, you don't feel comfortable wearing it. it takes seven compliments. I gave that example to the IBM folks in Vermont a while ago. And one manager said, I know what you mean. Said, I bought a new necktie, wore it for the first time, thought it looked pretty good. Walking down the hallway, one of my colleagues hollered after me, you look like a rectal thermometer. Three. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the necktie looked like, but I never wore it again. <laughs> Takes seven compliments. But the second thing 3M found was this. The second thing they found in that corporation was that in the average workplace, and I don't know if your places are average, in the average workplace, people hear nine negative words for every positive word. Nine times as many negative. If there's any truth in that, no wonder there are troubles in motivation and success. We're out there working, working, doing fairly well, and hear mostly negative comments. The number one job complaint I heard every day in some organization, you can predict it. Number one job complaint, you can do 100 things right and not hear a darn thing about it. The one thing wrong, they're right in your back. Ever hear that? That's the dumbest way of motivating anybody. If we had a task force that said, figure out the stupidest way of motivating someone, they come up with that one. Do a good job, ignore them, do one bad thing, jump in their case. I don't know, maybe I'm naive. I've had almost a million people in workshops the last 10 years. Sometimes small groups of six and sometimes big conventions of 10,000. But out of those million people, Never heard one single person tell me, at least, that they've gone home at the end of a day's work, complained to their husband or wife, and said, you know, I can't stand my job anymore, can't stand my job, have it up to here. All I hear on the job are compliments, compliments, compliments. <laughs> they love me over there, think I'm wonderful. <laughs> Nobody complains about that. But the number one complaint, you can do all these things right and not hear much about it. I was at a management workshop a while ago. I was pushing the whole idea of give your people more positive feedback. The research shows when you build people up, they feel better, they do better. That's pretty simple psychology. And this one manager got up and said, I'm not going to go around praising my employees for doing their job. That's what I pay them for. I thought to myself, you unenlightened soul. Those aren't the exact words I was thinking. <laughs> but all of you know, People work about this hard for money, and about this hard for money and some recognition, right? That we have more than one need in life. Most of us realize no matter how hard we work at our jobs, 
no matter how good we are at our jobs, we're not going to get really, really rich in our present positions. Agree with that? I'm not trying to shock you right now. <laughs> but not going to get rich, most of us. Which says one thing. You're working for more than a plain old paycheck. Working for a sense of making a difference, sense of achievement, a little pat in the back. Yet we live in this culture where you can do all these things right and not hear much about it. I'm saying this conditions us to fail. But it's not just at work. Our whole society is negative. I work with executives in lots of corporations, and I was asking one group of executives a while ago. I said, you're working 60, 70 hours a week. You're killing yourself. What do you do at night when you go home to relax? How do you relax at night? Can you guess? What's the number one answer for executives to relax in this country? What do you think? Drink is a good guess. That's number two. But number one is they watch TV. In particular, they watch the evening news to relax. Now, let me, let me ask you a simple question. When's the last time you watched the news and felt good about this country? <laughs> Almost all was negative, right? In fact, you ever watch the 6 o'clock news and wonder whether we as a nation would survive the 10 o'clock news? <laughs> they make everything sound dismal every night. Even the weather is negatively reported. They're going to say tomorrow, 20% chance of snow, which really means what? Yes, they don't say that very often. Or they might say tomorrow, partly cloudy, folks, which means partly sunny. Also, are you aware how 10 years ago they changed the weather report to make it more negative? Now, it's bad enough sometimes here in the wintertime. But they weren't content to leave well enough alone. They no longer say it's 15 degrees above zero. It's 47 below zero with what? Wind chill factor. Now, isn't that a blessing? <laughs> Don't know what you're going to suffer all the rest of the day right up front in the morning. I was in Scottsdale, Arizona a while ago at Doubletree Inn. I heard about these beautiful Arizona sunsets. I finished my talk this one evening, went out to the convention hall, and there was this gorgeous sunset. I turned to the man next to me, he'd been at the seminar, and I said, look at the sunset, isn't it beautiful? You know what he said? He said, I think the pinks are a little bright. <laughs> that even God didn't get it quite right. <laughs> of people finding things to complain about. In fact, check out my words on this one. You will find in any corporation, the most negative employees always find each other. They have coffee breaks together, lunches together. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. Call the daily pity party. <laughs> in fact, if you walk around some place of employment and say, oh, love this company, great corporation, good opportunity, love working here, oh, great place to work. Somebody else says, stick around three years, see what it's really like. If you love your job, they think there's something wrong with you many times. Complaining has become almost a national pastime. In Plymouth, one of our suburbs a while ago, I was doing a daycare convention, a bunch of people that provide meals for daycares. Before I went to talk to the audience, I went to the men's room, got cleaned up. Some guy comes in the men's room, men's room. never met him before. And he gives me a two-minute speech about how stupidly designed the urinals were. <laughs> I thought, this is a strange conversation. <laughs> I don't know if you ladies know this, but men don't talk about that kind of thing in bathrooms. <laughs> and I thought, what is he complaining about? He didn't mess or miss? You know, what's the big deal? <laughs> and it's this negatives. Now, of course, the negative conditioning to fail starts when we're kids. I was in Mankato, Minnesota one time doing some counseling with a mom. And this mother had teenage kids that she couldn't control, uh, wouldn't obey. She wanted advice. And I really didn't know what to tell her. So I said, why don't you go home and for one week, write in a piece of paper everything you tell the kids. And keep a record. What's positive? What's negative? Come back in a week. We'll talk it over. She came back a week later, and she was storming mad. Threw the list of my office floor and said, here you can have your darn list. Are you satisfied? Can you guess why she was mad? Yeah, no positive, almost all negative. 80% was negative. Didn't like learning it. She was a grouch. And I said, just a minute. There's a principle in communication that says people perform exactly as they see themselves. You tell your kids mostly negative things, they'll see themselves negatively, they'll perform that way. But say more positive things, the kids will begin to see themselves that way, they'll act accordingly. So that's my advice. Say more positive things, I think you'll see the kids change. Her response was, no way. Kids are no good these days, tell them off, put them in their place, that's what they need. I said, well, I don't know what else to suggest. I, I said, just try it, please. She said, okay, I'll try it. That was her attitude. 
She came back three weeks later and said, I don't know what's going on, but those kids sure are nice. <laughs> she couldn't figure out her communication had changed their behavior. And you think about it. You think about what is the last thing a kid hears when he leaves the house in the morning? Going to catch the school bus. What's the last thing dad tells him? Probably it's not the dad saying, oh, honey, have a wonderful day. I'll be awaiting your return. My life is more complete when you enter the house. <laughs> Probably not dad's parting comment. Kids catching the school bus and dad hollers, now don't get run over. <laughs> and you think about it, how many kids have that, have that as their goal for the day? <laughs> but it's the last thing they hear. On a very serious side, University of Iowa, they sent their Ph.D. students in family social sciences out to observe parents talking to their preschool kids. They said, go to all these families across the country, just sit in the background unobtrusively, count the number of negative comments per day the average parent tells her preschooler. And you might guess what they found out. How many negatives per day the average parent tells her preschooler? What would you guess back here? Any numbers okay? 15. About 15 negatives a day, you might guess. 25. 25, you might guess. 15. Okay, 15, 25. 18. 18. I'd say 25 or more. Okay, 25 or more. So 15, 18, 20, 25. And not bad guesses. But you're all a bit conservative. These were PhD students, we think a fairly reliable study. Included the average parent tells her preschooler over 400 negative comments per day. Like, no, 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 shut up, sit down. Who do you think you are? How many times I told you? And how many positives per day? About 10, like thanks or good job. I'm not suggesting permissive parenting. But I am saying that this imbalance of 400 negative to 10 positive, no wonder we're conditioned to fail. All research shows kids need boundaries, but it's the imbalance. We can't tell our kids, go on the street, see if cars hurt, try it for yourself. <laughs> but it's the imbalance. It's the constant impingement of negatives that conditions us to fail. It makes us think we can't do certain things. I'll give you one final example. I've mentioned daily conversation. I've mentioned the media, parenting, work, education. Final example. I would think the first thing you want to do if you're a teacher of a class is go in, get acquainted, know the names of the people, establish rapport, make it a learning community. That is not what happens in most college classrooms, if you know that. A professor comes in the first day and gives a stiff, formal overview of the requirements. You might say, good morning, class. My name is Dr. So-and-so. This is History 202. In this class, there are four books to read, two tests to take, four papers to write. Papers need to be on my desk on time. No excuses accepted. Your mother dies, she dies. Any questions? Nobody asks anything, of course. But, but I, I think of John Powell, who I've respected a great deal for years. John is a best-selling author, a priest, a professor. He has won so many teaching awards, students wait three years to get in his classes. He said, I am convinced that our society is so conditioned negatively, people get emotionally allergic to hearing people speak positively. So he an experiment. He went to his class the first day. Imagine you're the students, I'm the professor. Walks in the first day and says, good morning, class. My name is John. I want to welcome you here. I want to tell you something very, very important. And that is that I really really love myself. I have a message that is so inspiring, just may change your life. I'm patient, I'm generous, I'm kind, I'm loving. I want you to know that over the years, students have always come to love me, and all of you will come to love me this quarter. Could you imagine reacting to students the first few minutes of that class? <laughs> yeah, kind of like you. <laughs> <laughs> One guy in the back row went, yuck, what conceit. <laughs> One lady in the front row looked so nauseous, he thought she was going to vomit all over everybody. He came back to class the next day. He said, you know what I was doing yesterday? I was throwing a self-celebration party. Anybody come? Nobody said anything. They all looked down. I heard John say later on, in all my years of teaching, that was the only group of students I could never get close to. They sat there all quartered like frozen icicles, thinking this guy is weird. That told me something very significant. 
that sometimes we're so addicted to negative thinking, so addicted to negative garbage, that when someone comes in and says something positive about themselves, as John did, we think there's something wrong with them instead of something right with them. I even hear people go this far. I hear something nice about this gentleman, and somebody else says, don't tell him, it might go to his head. You ever hear people talk that way? And I think to myself, well, what do I want in his head? Discouragement? And I also wonder who appointed me God's guardian of his humility. Not really my role in life. But simply saying it's this constant impingement of negatives that conditions people to not use their full potential. We've talked about all these negative things that condition us to fail. And I would suggest a concept called killer statements. A killer statement is something said to you on the job that makes you feel lousy, tears apart your self-esteem, or might demotivate. A killer statement might be you go to some colleague and say, I'd like your help in this project, and they say, that's not my job. Or you go to somebody and you'd say, uh, Jed, I'd like your support on this particular thing. And they say, oh, we've never done that kind of thing before. Or we've always done it like this. Or oh, it's not in the budget. And there are literally hundreds of negatives that we hear on the job. Yes, sometimes they're legitimate. But lots of times they're said to shut people up, stop change, don't rock the boat. And the price we pay is turning off our employees. For a moment, I'd like just to stay in your chairs, but face a person next to you. It might be a group of two or three. And just talk briefly about what are some killer statements that you've heard on the job. Negatives, whether your present place of employment, someplace else, and negatives that people sometimes tell each other. So take a minute, please, and just talk to the person next to you, if you would. <laughs> what are some killer statements that you might have heard over the years? What might be some examples? What would you think of? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, you can't fight City Hall, yes. So you can complain about the government, but don't do anything about it. You can't fight City Hall. Other ones? We just can't do it that way. Yeah, we just can't do it that way. Good. Or others? Not my job. Not my job, yes. Got to be the battle cry of the loser. Not my job, not my job. Don't say too much, let things lie. Yeah, don't say too much, just let things lie. Yes. Good examples. Also, they say it's not that important. It's not that important. Yeah, don't get hot and bothered about that. Yeah. So we're saying over and over again, all these negatives, given plenty of examples. Maybe one other final example is television. I believe television programs people, turns them into certain types of individuals. We know when our kids have finished high school, they've watched hundreds and thousands of hours of TV, and it shapes who they become. For example, I wish this were possible. It's not. But you could take almost any program on TV today, maybe one or two exceptions, almost any program on TV today, and show one of today's programs 15 years ago. And we've been shocked then at the stuff we see today. Agree with me? We've been shocked at the language on TV, the plots, the innuendos, the lifestyles. We've been shocked 15 years ago. We've watched so many years of that stuff. The average person watches TV, giggles and thinks, oh, oh kind of funny. And they don't realize how the whole value system of a nation has been changed by somebody else's programming. And so we come in with an empty mind. That's the first part. We're exposed to all the negatives. And eventually, we adopt. We are programmed or conditioned to fail. We adopt the stuff we're exposed to. No kid, for example, at age five, walks around the house and says, well, gee, mom and dad are being mighty negative today. 400 negative comments. That's too heavy. I don't buy that. No kid watches TV and says, that program is racist. That one is violent. That one is sexist. I don't buy that. It doesn't fit with my values. Kids aren't able to think that way. If you know about child development, they can't think that way for another 10 to 15 years. What they're exposed to, they adopt. We're conditioned to fail. Let me show you how it works for a moment. What's your name here? Dwight. Uh, Dwight? Uh, come up here if you would, please. Thanks for volunteering. Oh, sure. <laughs> You have a good back, arms, you're not injured in some way? Oh, I'm 
fit. You're in fit. Okay, good. <laughs> I've been doing some work studying along the lines with Dr. Jack Diamond. He does this down in Australia. And Jack Diamond's a physician. He writes a book called Behavioral Kinesiology, or Your Body Doesn't Lie. He says what you think about yourself, what others think about you, will dramatically affect your performance in life. I'm going to ask Dwight to put his arms up in a moment like this. I'm going to put my hands on top of his. I want you to resist with all your strength. And it doesn't matter if I'm stronger, you're stronger. I want to catch a level of strength. Okay? okay. Put your arms out like this, Dwight. You ready? Resist with all your strength, please. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> okay. And your name is? Diane. Come on up here, Diane. <laughs> Stand back here a little bit. Stand right here, Diane. Do you know Dwight? Yes, you we know, met. You met just briefly. Right. Okay. I'm going to ask Dwight to stand here. And for a moment, not just yet, in a moment he's going to be closing his eyes for 30 seconds. During those 30 seconds, I want you to look at him and think rotten thoughts about him. <laughs> that he's dumb, he's ugly, he's incompetent, shouldn't be amongst this fine group, you hate him, he's disgusting. Could you do that for me? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Should be no problem. <laughs> I know he's a nice guy, we're just pretending. But during those 30 seconds, Dwight, I don't want you to tell yourself anything, don't think anything, just stand there and relax. Okay? okay. Just close your eyes, please. I'll be right here. I'll let you think those private thoughts then, please. All right, that's about 30 seconds. You can open your eyes, Dwight. Did you think some of those thoughts? Mm -hmm. Good. I thought of a couple things also. <laughs> Let's just sit back down. The same thing, Dwight. Why don't you put your arms back up and again, with all your strength, why don't you to resist? You ready? Yeah. And resist. <laughs> <laughs> what a wimp. And what a wimp. Yeah. <laughs> Glad to stay here. It's not some kind of gimmick or trick. I didn't set Dwight up to do it. Never met him before in my life. But it always works that way. It takes 30 seconds of someone thinking negative thoughts to zap your strength and energy. And you think, well, he's just getting tired. I pushed hard the first time. It's not physiological. It's psychological. In fact, try this. I'd like all of you to look at Dwight right now. <laughs> and, and all of you get into disliking Dwight. All look at him and think negative thoughts, that he's stupid, ugly, incompetent. Really get into disliking him. Again, we're just pretending, but think those thoughts. Will you do that for me? Look up here at Dwight, please. Think those thoughts. And Dwight, one more time, close your eyes, please. All right, that's about 30 seconds again. You can open your eyes here, Dwight. And again, why don't you put your arms back up. And with all your strength, why don't you resist again. You ready? Okay. And resist. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you see the difference? What happened? What happened? Yeah, I told him. What do you think I told him? Yeah, something positive. Tell you tell yourself what, Dwight? I'm a great person. Yeah, just say I'm a great person over and over again. I'm a great person. I'm a great person. If one person like Diane can wipe him out, you'd think 50 would make him do something dramatic, like wet his pants or something <laughs> up here. <laughs> Should get to be the weakest is perhaps the strongest. Back in 52, Norman Vincent Peale wrote the book, Power of Positive Thinking. And Peale said the positive thought long enough will push aside the negatives. A theologian, psychologist said, oh, that's stupid, it's Pollyannish, doesn't work, positive thinking. Couldn't prove until a few years ago the Soviet Union developed Korean photography. Korean photography shows the body doesn't stop here. There are layers of energy around the body. When you're thinking nothing in particular, and that was the first instruction when Diane was here, just stand here and relax. That when you're thinking nothing in particular, it shows up as holes in layer of energy. One person comes along like Diane thinks a native thought, zaps him. Down goes the strength. 
when you're thinking positive thoughts like I'm a great person, it shows up as a big orange-yellow halo around his body. In a sense, puts up a shield, negative bounces off. To me, that's scary stuff. It means you can go to work someday. You're not doing your positive thinking. You work around some negative coworkers who are shooting darts at you. By 12 o'clock, you feel tired, and by 5 o'clock, dead. The thoughts will dramatically influence, impact your performance. What they're thinking, but you have more power if you know how to program your mind for success. Would you thank Dwight for that, please? Thank you. Let's try a variation. Um, in the back here, what, what's your name? Uh, David. David, come on up here, David. You're okay physically? Yes. Not hurt in some way? <laughs> the same thing, let's put your arms up here and have you resist, test your strength level. Okay. You ready? Yep. Resist. Okay. okay. Good. And relax. <laughs> Put your arms up and resist with all your strength again. <laughs> Are you trying? Yeah, I was trying. Try it again. All, all, all your strength now. Okay. Ready? All, right. all your strength. Yeah. <laughs> And you see what happens. A dirty look can wipe somebody else out. Could be a thought, it could be a look. Or I might say, David, right? Right. Uh, you look good, you're a handsome fellow. I appreciate you being a good sport. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Put your arms back up, please, and resist all your strength again. <laughs> and of course, saying a good sport's positive feedback rings it right back up again. Thank him for that, please. Maybe we can find a variation. Uh, your name is what? Nancy. Would you help me out, Nancy, too? <laughs> this is a little bit different. I'd like you, Nancy, to go outside the door. Oh. Right back there. We'll call you back in about 30 seconds. <laughs> People sometimes say this behavioral kinesiology works only because they knew what was happening where Dwight knew that she was thinking negative thoughts, or David could see me making dirty facial expressions. What if the person doesn't know what you're thinking? Does it make a difference? Absolutely. It doesn't matter if they know or don't know. The subconscious picks up the vibes. I'm going to bring her in. Nancy's the name. And I'll just test her strength again, too. It doesn't matter who's stronger. Catch the level of strength. I'm going to ask her some questions. I'll ask her where she was born. I don't know where she was born. Whatever her answer is, I want you all to think in your heads quietly, Nancy's a jerk, Nancy's a jerk, Nancy's a jerk. We'll test her strength, see what happens. I'll ask her how long she's worked for her present company. I don't know what the answer is either. Whatever she says, you'll think, Nancy's great, Nancy's great. Okay? We'll go back and forth a couple of times. So where she's born, you're thinking she's a jerk. And uh, how long for the company, she's great. Would you bring Nancy back in, please? Let's go over here, Nancy. Thank you. And you're physically all right. Your arms, good. Just face the group. We'll do the same thing. I want to test your strength. And again, it doesn't matter who's stronger or weaker. I want to catch the level of strength. Okay. okay. Just put your arms up like this, please. And resist. Oh, very good. <laughs> good. 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 I don't know anything about you, Nancy. I'd like to get a little bit acquainted. I'm curious, where were you born, Nancy? I was born in Rush City, Minnesota. Rush City, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh, wonderful. Now put your arms back up, please. And with all your strength, resist again. Okay. Oh, I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> you're glad you don't live in Rush City anymore. <laughs> now, you're working at a company here in town, right? Yes. How long have you been working for that company? Eight years. Eight years. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful. Eight years. Put your arms back up again, please, and resist all your strength. You ready? Good. <laughs> now, you said you were born in Rush City? Rush City. It's R-U-S-H? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Rush City. Put your arms back up again, please. Resist all your strength. Wait now. Let me get my muscle. <laughs> okay, sure. Sure. Shake them loose if you want. Okay. Rush City, huh? Rush City. Okay, good. 
You're wondering what's happening here? <laughs> <laughs> I was making the point that people don't have to know what somebody else thinks to affect your performance. Whenever I was asking you where you were born, you're all thinking Nancy's a jerk. jerk. <laughs> And when I asked how long she worked for a company, you're all thinking Nancy's great. great. You think she's a good person? Yes. yes. Let's make sure. Put your arms up, please, and resist. <laughs> <laughs> and she's wrong again. Thank you for that. Thank you, Nancy. So I've given you two words that were, first of all, exposed to people's negatives. And like you've been saying here, we adopt. Automatically adopt those kind of things. I'll give you two other little words to put this all together, how the mind gets conditioned. The first word is garden. How many have had a garden? Good. If you've had a garden, there are two basic principles in gardening. The first one is, whatever you put into the ground is basically what comes up again. Like you don't go out and plant beans, hope to get carrots. Agree with me? Mm -hmm. What you put in is what comes up. But you also know you don't go out and plant a bean seed, hope to get back the same bean. What do you hope to get back? More beans. It'd be stupid to go out there and plant that bean in all season, water, mulch, fertilize. Then in September, say, oh, I got my bean back. Fantastic. Got my bean. <laughs> be a stupid waste of effort. Hopefully the rain comes down, sun comes down, right proportions, and you get a harvest multiplication. Same way the mind works. Between the time that you put a thought in your mind and your behavior comes out, your imagination enters the picture and multiplies the results. And one single negative comment can program you for 50 years. And here I'll suggest something very important. Everything you don't like about yourself, everything you think you're no good at, can be traced back to somebody else's negative feedback. You were not born disliking anything. People taught you to dislike things. Let's say, for example, over here your name is Roy. Roy, Roy might say, well, I can't sing. I'm no good at singing. Can't carry a tune. No good at singing. Chances are when Roy was born, didn't come out of the womb with a little label in the forehead that said, poor singer created by God. <laughs> didn't have that self-concept. But if you traced it back, you might find a situation like uh, second grade. They're having a school sing-along, a little pageant. And the teacher pulled him aside and said, now Roy, when we get to the singing part, could you just mouth the words <laughs> or blend in the background? Some kids were actually told that. And 50 years later thought, oh, I can't sing. I don't even try in church. I can't sing. Whatever goes in comes back up. But the mind also works like a computer. How many work with computers? Okay, then this is things you're quite familiar with. <laughs> There's that old slogan that used to say, you put garbage in, you get garbage. Yeah. It doesn't matter how good the machinery is if you've got the wrong kind of programming. Let's say over here, your name is Rick. Rick. What town do you live in, Rick? Uh, Edina. Edina. Let's say Rick comes to me during a break and says, Al, this is kind of interesting stuff. If you're ever in a diner, here's my home address. Stop by, have a cup of coffee, I'd like to visit with you. I say, sure, sounds fine. Let's say six months go by, I'm driving through a diner, I got some free time, I stop at his house. And he says, well, Al, Al Zimmerman, come on in. I promise you a cup of coffee, come on in and have a cup of coffee. I go into his house. I carry with me four great big glad bags full of wet, stinky, smelly garbage. They've been in the trunk of my car for six months. In those bags, I got baby diapers, rotten vegetables, coffee grounds, you name it, I got it. I drag the bags into Rick, right? Rick's house. I open the twisties on top of the bags. Are they going to put the garbage on his living room floor, down the dining room hallway? I put it in the bedroom, the bathrooms, all over. I put the slime, the smell, the garbage. My guess would be that Rick and I would very quickly have an interpersonal problem. You agree with that? Mm. He might threaten to beat me up, or might threaten to call the police, or I don't know, maybe Rick's got a gun around the house. Might pull the gun out and say, Al, I'm going to bet you can clean this up. <laughs> and bet I could too. In fact, I would clean the house up so beautifully there would not be a trace of garbage left, and the incident would be totally over with, right? You're shaking your heads, no, why would it not be over with? I cleaned the house up. Smell, I had pine saw, I got rid of the smell. He'll never forget it, yes. He has memory hanging around. What happens to Rick? Goes to work the next day. He said, remember that Al Zimmerman character I talked about? He was at my house yesterday. He's shot the guy. Wish I had. <laughs> Whenever he tells a story, what happens to his emotions again? He gets angry again, yes. 
What's the point of the story? The person that comes to your house and dumps a bunch of garbage doesn't do a great deal of damage. But what do you do when someone comes along and dumps garbage in your mind? They criticize you, your company, the amount of money that you make, the husband or wife you chose, the way you raise your children, the church you choose to attend, your goals for the future, the way you spend your free time, the way you dress your body, the way you decorate your house. When they dump their garbage in your mind, what do you do? Some people say, well, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's the dumbest comment around. Whatever goes in, comes back out. Garbage in, garbage out. Way back in 1972, the Surgeon General said, those who watch violence on TV act more violently. Well, Hollywood said, oh, that's ridiculous. They said the rapes on TV, the murders, the arsons, the beatings, it's good for people, it's escapism. Don't get so uptight. So 10 more years of research were done. From 72 to 82 at Harvard, Stanford, and they came out with a new report in 83 and said those who watch violence on TV act twice as violently as those not exposed to it. And it's true for every age group, kids through adults. And they said, don't misinterpret the study. Doesn't mean we all become rapists or murderers, but it might mean in the midst of a family argument, you raise your voice more quickly, you throw a few cuss words out, you slam the door, or maybe you share sign language with other motorists on the highway. <laughs> but you put in the garbage, you put in the violence, and out it comes. So the process is that we're born with an empty mind. We're exposed to the negatives, we adopt those negatives, and after a while of adopting enough negatives, people actually get addicted. Just like they get addicted to chemicals, get addicted to negative thinking. According to Dr. David Reeskin, the book The Lonely Crowd, he says 85% of people in this country are programmed negatively. They're addicted to the negative. I don't know how you're programmed. But let's say you go back to work later this afternoon. There's a note on your desk from your boss that says, see me immediately. What is your first reaction? What do I do this time? Most likely you don't say, well, gee, the race is coming early this year. Fantastic. <laughs> but I'm sure glad he's, he's consulting me before he makes a decision. <laughs> or you got some kid comes home from school with a note from the teacher. The note says, I want a conference as quickly as possible. Your first reaction again is, what do you do? 85% addicted to the negative. Teresa Jones, Wilmington, Delaware, had a badly infected kidney. They had to cut the thing out of her. They put her under anesthesia, the doctors were going to open her up, take out the kidney. Before they did that, did a final test and found out some miracle had taken place. Couldn't figure it out. They were totally happy. They were rejoicing. They put her in the recovery room. When she opened her eyes, before she heard the good news that she was all healed, Teresa opened her eyes, saw the doctor, and said, Oh, it hurts! The pain, the incision, the stitches, oh, it hurts! You should have seen one embarrassed Teresa Jones. They said, Honey, we didn't do anything. <laughs> What happened is she went in there expecting pain, and that's what she got. Got addicted. So what are the results of all this programming? All the stuff that you've heard over the years, you end up being who you are, where you are, what you are. But what's going into your mind? In particular, you end up performing as you tell yourself. Oh, mom or dad might have said negative 50 years ago, some boss 25 years ago. They might be long gone. But we get addicted, and we keep ourselves conditioned to fail by continuing the negative sentences. And the first step in changing this stuff around is be careful of repeating over and over negative sentences. Because the more you say it, the more you must behave that way. I, I can think of this example. Go to workshops. And people will go and get a cup of coffee during break. They'll come back, put the coffee on the floor by their chair, and they'll say, now watch me spell this. <laughs> and they usually do right across town here. You know the Holiday Inn Metrodome? Know what I'm talking about? I was doing a workshop there some years ago, and it was at Radisson. A group of 400 advertisers, evening banquet. I was at the head table. I ate my dinner. Waitress comes in, picks up the dishes like this, carries all the dishes through the exit door, and crashes them all on the floor. At that moment, she said something out loud. Can you guess what she said? Without swearing. <laughs> yeah, I knew I was going to do that. I thought to myself, why did you pick up the dishes? <laughs> we perform as we tell ourselves. The way we keep the conditioning going is a concept called mind binders. A mind binder is a little negative sentence you tell yourself over and over again. And the more you talk that way, the more you're going to be stuck. 
My mind there might be, well, I can't get going in the morning. I can't lose weight, can't stick to a diet. I can't save money, can't balance a checkbook. I'm no good at this. I can't do that. Again, as long as you say those mind binders, you're going to be stuck. What might be some mind binders you've heard over the years? What might come to mind? Negative sense people tell themselves. I don't have the time. I don't have the time. In fact, you ever watch people at work talking about how much work they have to do instead of doing it? <laughs> yeah. oh, I'm too busy, don't have the time. Other ones? Can't do public speaking. You know, I can't give a speech. Yeah, can't give a speech. Can't remember names. Can't remember names. How many struggle with can't remember names? People will challenge me in workshops and say, Al, that is not negative thinking. That's just plain reality. I'm no good at names. <laughs> it has nothing to do with reality. For example, I go over here, and your name is Sue. Sue, and Sue might say, Al, I disagree. I, I'm terrible at names. I have no ability whatsoever. You might say, Sue, I disagree with you. In fact, I, I'll bet you're excellent at names. I'll make you a deal. I will pay you $100 for every single name of every person in this group you happen to learn today. You see me a little. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You see me after the seminar. Every name you can repeat, hundred dollars. I bet she would know lots of names. Which tells me she always had the ability, just didn't have the what motivation to do it. Other sentences you've heard quite a bit: mind binders. People really knew me, they wouldn't like me. Well, people knew me, they wouldn't like me. Whoa. Yeah. Or maybe you know employees like this that say, I always get a headache every day, 3 o'clock, get a headache every day, 3 o'clock. What time is it? 2.30? About 30 more minutes, should be here. <laughs> or maybe you've seen people say this, I can't save money, can't save money. So what happens? They go to some mall, they see a big sale sign, well, might as well spend it, can't save it anyway. <laughs> Already programmed that way. Or you perhaps see in the January papers after the holidays, always the ads for the weight reduction systems. Maybe you saw this in the paper also a while ago. They said in the research, if all they do is teach how to eat differently but not think differently, over 95% gain the weight back again. You've got to change the way you think, not just the way you eat. Or our scary research study about three years ago said this. People that go around affirming senility, saying things like, I'm so forgetful, getting old, memory slipping, must be a sign of old age, and of Alzheimer's someday. Poor memory. Found those who say that increase dramatically their chance of becoming senile later in life. Said, don't say it. Your subconscious mind does one purpose, do what's been told to do. Be careful of saying the negatives over and over again. So it's the mind binders. Can't remember names, can't do this, can't do that. So how do you begin to change this stuff around? Again, the process, you're born with an empty mind, exposed to lots of negatives, you adopt the negatives, and then get addicted. So how do you begin to change this stuff around? Again, the process, you're born with an empty mind, exposed to lots of negatives, you adopt the negatives, and then get addicted. Keep the addiction going by repeating the negative mind binders over and over again. You change it around by beginning to realize that you really can change who you are, what you are, where you are, by changing what goes into the mind. And the most important thing I would suggest at this point is something called the displacement principle. Displacement says you can only have one thought in your mind at a time. Can't have two thoughts, same mind, same moment. Let's say you get up some morning and say to yourself, Oh, I'm dead tired, rolled and tossed all night, don't feel good. Oh, don't go to work, don't feel good, didn't sleep last night. That's a mind binder. It'll never make your life better. But if you told yourself a positive affirmation like this, I'm full of energy, enthusiasm, full of energy, enthusiasm, you would quickly displace the negative thought. You can't have two thoughts, same mind, same moment. Now, that negative thought, I'm dead tired, might come back instantly because that's an habitual way of thinking. But if you told yourself that new positive affirmation with repetition, repetition, eventually, that sentence will go from conscious to subconscious. In a sense, you would push out the old negative mind binder. The new affirmation takes control. This displacement principle comes from physics. 
If I had a bucket of water up here, if I dropped in a stone, what happens to the stone? It sinks, right, right. I asked some engineers one time, and a guy said it gets wet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it sinks. And if I drop in the stone, what happens to the water? It rises. How much rises? Same volume of the stone, right? You know your physics. If I put in lots and lots of stones, pretty soon I have lots of stones and very little. Again, same way the mind works. Charles Kettering was a great engineer years ago. He brought GM into being the biggest corporation in the world. He learned about this behavioral kinesiology stuff, the arm stuff, the mental stuff, 75 years ago. But his friends were skeptical, said, oh, we don't believe in that affirmation stuff. The way you think doesn't make any difference. So he went to his friend Joe one day and he said, Joe, I know you're skeptical. I'll make you a deal. He said, here's a beautiful bird cage. If you'll hang the cage in your living room, I will bet you that you will have to buy a bird to put in the cage. And Joe said, that's ridiculous. He said, if I just hang the cage, if I don't buy a bird, I win the bet. He said, yeah. I'll bet you have to buy a bird. Joe said, I'll take the bet. Joe took the cage, hung the cage in the living room. Next three months, Kettering didn't come by. During those three months, Joe had lots of visitors. They all came to the house. They all sat in the living room. Can you guess the first sentence they all said to Joe? Where's the bird, Joe? <laughs> and he said, I never had a bird. They said, Joe, you can tell me what you do to the bird. <laughs> or his friends would say over and over again, nobody has a beautiful bird cage without a bird in it. He went to bed at night, started having dreams. That nobody has a beautiful bird cage without a bird in it. He found himself driving home from work. He was taking new routes. He was driving by pet stores, looking in the window. Any birds there? Three months went by, Kettering came back, and as you can guess, there was a bird in the cage. <laughs> as dumb as it sounds, when you begin to tell yourself positive affirmations, you're hanging empty bird cages in your mind. They're empty because the first few days you tell yourself, I'm full of energy, enthusiasm, full of energy, enthusiasm, first few days your mind goes, liar, liar, liar. <laughs> but after a while, through a process called mental osmosis, that sentence goes from conscious to subconscious. Or in a sense, you fill the birdcage with belief, and out comes action. Then change is easy, change is automatic. It's what all the Olympic athletes are doing. If you watched the Olympics the last few years, and I interviewed those people, they'll say it's 95% mental, 5% physical. It only goes so far with the body, but the mind is unlimited. It's talking to itself positively over and over again. Uh, the famous boxer, Muhammad Ali, what was his famous affirmation? I'm yeah, I'm the greatest. Say, I am the greatest, I am the greatest. And people sometimes got nauseous listening, thought he was too conceited. But that wasn't a bad thing for him to say. For example, how would you like to go into a boxing ring thinking you weren't too hot? <laughs> you get killed. You saw it happen to the arms. It was a self-survival mechanism. And so I want to teach you the process as to how you get rid of all the old mind binders and reprogram yourself for change, for success, to accomplish what you want to accomplish. I'm going to give you a number of positive affirmations. Something like Dwight was doing, saying, I'm a great person. You'll talk to yourself quietly, saying the sentences over and over in your head. If you don't get the exact wording of a sentence, eh, don't worry about it. I'll give them to you a couple times. Get the gist of it, the main point. Also, some of the sentences I give you will not be true of you yet. I don't want you to sit there and argue with yourself. If I say, for example, I am well organized in all parts of my life, you don't say, oh yeah, office is a mess, house is a mess. <laughs> That's irrelevant. First you say it, then you believe it, then you do it. And so you'll simply relax a little bit, you'll be closing your eyes a little bit, you'll be saying them over and over again. So feet flat on the floor, rest your hands in your laps. I would suggest your own lap. <laughs> and then just close your eyes, please. It'll take just two, three minutes. I'd like you to begin by taking a nice deep breath of air. We've been going rather rapidly this morning. Take a moment to relax. Another nice deep breath of air. I'll give you some sentences. Just say them quietly in your head over and over. I love myself unconditionally. I love myself unconditionally. 
I have unconditional love for all people at all times. I have unconditional love for all people at all times. I can easily relax at any time. I can easily relax at any time. Every day, through every affirmation, I am getting healthier in body, mind, and spirit. Every day, through every affirmation, I'm getting healthier in body, mind, and spirit. Every day, in every way, I am getting better and better. Every day, in every way, I am getting better and better. I am patient, skillful, and understanding in dealing with my co-workers, my customers, and my family members. I am patient, skillful, and understanding in dealing with my co-workers, my customers, and my family members. I have an excellent memory with clear and easy recall. I have an excellent memory with clear and easy recall. I'm filled with vitality, energy, and physical stamina. I'm filled with vitality, energy, and physical stamina. I'm positive, courageous, and enthusiastic about every moment of my life. I am positive, courageous, and enthusiastic about every moment of my life. Let me take one more deep breath of air and open your eyes again. Now, for some of us, that might seem familiar because you do that. You talk to yourself positively every day two, three times. For others, it might seem kind of strange. If you've read the best-selling books by Dr. Dennis Waitley, Seeds of Greatness or Psychology of Winning, he's one of the highest paid psychologists today in the country. He spent like 15 years researching the biggest winners in American society. Might have been NASA astronauts, gold medal winners at the Olympics. People start out poor in life, end up running great big corporations after studying those types of people. He writes in his book, or in his books, Every winner I've ever met in every single profession of life, every single day, uses that technique of mental affirmations. Never met an exception. That they seem to know that we live in this negative world and to get rid of the negative conditioning, got to put in your own positive programming. This affirmation thing, maybe something you're already doing, maybe something that's different to you. And it's not some new, fancy kind of pop psychology. Even the Bible talks about it. A couple thousand years ago, it says, think on these things that are clean, pure, powerful. Be transformed with the renewing of the mind. In other words, what you think about makes a difference. 
So if I were to ask you, what are affirmations? Simply put, they're positive sentences you tell yourself over and over again. So they eventually go from conscious to subconscious, where then change is easy, change is automatic. We've talked about, and you've tried a little bit how the affirmation process works. Let's design something specifically for each of you personally. It starts with, first of all, I say defining your goal. The most important affirmations are not the ones I just gave you in that exercise. Those are nice. I said, for example, that I have an excellent memory. Uh, maybe you already have a great memory. Maybe you don't need that one. I said it was filled with energy. Maybe you already have lots of energy. The most important affirmations are the ones that you design for yourself. You define your goal first. Quite simply, what do you want to add to your life or subtract from it? Maybe you want to add extra responsibility, move up in the corporate world. Maybe you want to add extra skill in golf. Maybe you want to add some skill at dealing with children. Maybe you want to add uh, extra income. Or maybe you want to subtract something. Maybe you want to subtract 20 pounds, a smoking habit, losing your temper. You decide what your goals are. Once you know what your goals are, there are six guidelines as to how you write affirmations. And these are important. If you don't write affirmations appropriately, they don't work. Our mind works in terms of certain language structure. When you had your eyes closed, number one guideline, all the affirmations I gave you were present tense. Like, I have an excellent memory. I can easily relax. I love myself. All present tense. Now, that sounds weird if it's not true. If I say, for example, I have an excellent memory, and you might be saying, oh, yeah, I can't remember anything. It sounds weird to say present tense. But remember, the subconscious mind cannot tell what is truth, what is untruth. It accepts all things as reality. If you tell yourself, for example, I weigh a slim trim 150, and you weigh 186, it sounds like a lie. But the subconscious doesn't know that. If you'll say over and over, I weigh a slim trim 150, weigh a slim trim 150, eventually subconscious mind will buy that and pounds will shed automatically. So you get rid of the I will, I'm going to, but make it present tense. The second guideline is affirmations are personal. That simply means you start with the word I. I can achieve, I can do, I'm learning, I'm doing, an I statement. You cannot make affirmations to control somebody else. That my children will listen to me. That's another, another seminar. <laughs> <laughs> so, present tense, personal, number three, positive direction. When you're closing your eyes doing affirmations, I avoided words like don't, can't, not, never. The reason for the negative words to get rid of is you try to picture the affirmation. If you put in a negative word, you're trying to picture the absence of something instead of the presence. It confuses the mind. If I say, for example, right now, uh, do me a favor. Do not, please do not, anybody, do not think of a dog. Now, don't think of a dog of me. Don't think of a dog. And what do you do? Think you think of a dog. <laughs> and so you want to affirm what you want it to be instead of what you don't want it to be. Positive direction. Instead of saying, I don't lose my temper, it might be, I remain calm during tough times. Instead of saying, I don't smoke, it might be, I enjoy having clean, healthy lungs. Positive direction. The fourth guideline and it includes a feeling word, feeling word. It might be such as, uh, I enjoy exercising three times a week. Maybe you hate exercising, that is irrelevant. First you say it, then you begin to feel, then begin to do it. Feeling word. You see what motivates people, not things. It's feelings. We don't work hard to save a bunch of money to buy some house because we like the boards in the house. It's the feeling of owning my own house. The feeling of being in that part of town. Or you don't buy some car because you like the steel in the car. It's the feeling of, oh, driving that model. So you get a quicker result, you put the feelings in. It might be you're uncomfortable meeting strangers. Well, you might say to yourself, I feel comfortable going up and meeting new individuals. Feeling word. Fifth guideline, specific. The more specific you make the affirmation, the quicker you get results also. If, for example, you want a new car. If you're saying, I'm driving my new car, too vague. What if you say, I'm enjoying driving my new 19-whatever, blue Oldsmobile 98? You can get a picture of that, specific. If you want to say, I'm losing weight, too vague. It might be, I enjoy weighing 123. Again, whatever your goal is. And the sixth guideline, action modifier. 
An action modifier is an L-Y adverb, like easily, quickly, comfortably. I easily reach my goals. I quickly approach difficult tasks. Six guidelines. The most important ones are one, two, three. Present tense, personal, and positive. The other four, five, six, about feeling, specific, action modifier, a little bit more optional. But they have to be positive, personal, present tense. I'll just give you a little bit of practice. Well, what might be some examples of affirmation that come to mind? Uh, what's one that you thought of over here? Oh, my. <laughs> um, I am saving money. I am going to save money to build a house in the near immediate future. Okay. I'm going to save money to buy a house in the immediate future. Great. Even make it stronger by saying, I am saving money, instead of I am going to. <laughs> because saying, I am saving, because I'm already doing it. Mm -hmm, good. One of yours back here might be what? I like myself. I like myself, yeah. I tell my students years ago, your assignment is 25 times a day, tell, my, tell yourself, I like myself, I like myself, I like myself. Not to become conceited or arrogant, but quite simply, you say it over and over again. And eventually, go to the subconscious, begin to have greater self-esteem. One of yours might be, I like myself. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Well, once you got the affirmations, how do they work? What's the process? Maybe an example from Jack Canfield. Jack is a speaker, as I am. And he wrote a best-selling book back in 1976 called 100 Ways to Increase Self-Esteem. Very good book. But by 1978, he hadn't made much money on the thing, a few hundred dollars. For every copy sold, he made 25 cents. Eh, publisher made the rest of the money. So he wanted to see if affirmations work, so he wrote himself the affirmation, I am earning $100,000 a year. I said, he must realize that was a lot of money for me back in 1978. Still is for most folks these days, $100,000 a year. <laughs> so it was a lot of money for me because I was a teacher making 18 one 18 five for five years in a row. So he wrote the affirmation, I'm earning $100,000 a year. His mind went, yeah, sure, buddy. He choked on it. But he kept saying it over and over again. And if you will say your affirmations over and over and over, one of two things will happen to you. One is you'll begin to see things you never saw before. You give your mind, for example, an $18,000 problem, it finds an $18,000 answer. But give it a $100,000 problem, it finds that kind of answer. You begin to see things you never saw before. If, for example, this happened to you and you didn't know what you were seeing, or maybe you decided to buy a new car, you did the research, read consumer reports, you decided on a certain model. Then you ever notice you see them all over town? There's one, there's one, there's one. <laughs> now there's no more today or a great deal more than yesterday. Except we're going to get one of those things you begin seeing. Or you'll begin to move automatically in the direction of your affirmation, such as, I like myself. So Jack began to say it over and over again, I'm earning $100,000 a year. After two weeks, Bruce Jenner came to mind. You know Bruce, the Olympics? He used affirmations all the time. In addition to saying his affirmations, Bruce took a photographer with him and they staged all the events in the Olympics before it occurred. He made it look like he was coming through the finish line. He pictured himself getting the gold medal, the wreaths, looked like he'd already won. Put the pictures on his mirror, his locker, all throughout his daily life, they're plastered around the pictures. He said, it was so ingrained in my mind, I simply went out and did it. So Jack Canfield said, well, how do you get a picture of a $100,000 bill? He went to the office supply store. Bought himself a piece of green construction paper, color of money. He drew a $100,000 bill. And now we don't make them that big, but he drew one. Put the picture on the ceiling above his bed. He'd get up in the morning and say, I'm earning $100,000 a year. He'd say it a few times. He'd see it at night. I'm earning $100,000 a year. A year. Say it a few more times. After two weeks, he was at his grandmother's house. And there on the coffee table was Reader's Digest. He'd seen it thousands of times. Now, jumping off the cover, it said, seven million readers a month. And he said, whoa. They publish excerpts of books in there. Maybe if I send off an excerpt of my book, they might publish it. Maybe seven million would look at it. 400,000 might buy a copy. I'd get a quarter piece, $100,000. Never thought of that solution. Sent off the excerpt. They rejected it. But no big deal. They kept affirming $100,000. A couple more weeks go by, another idea comes to mind. And he said, I could put an ad in there. He got a beautiful one-page ad designed for his book, sent off to Reader's Digest. They accepted the ad. But there was a problem. Back in 1978, a one-page ad for one issue of Reader's Digest 
cost $108,000. So even if I succeeded, it'd be $8,000 in the hole. It wasn't a good idea. <laughs> but he kept affirming over and over $100,000. A couple more weeks go by. He's at the grocery store, and the checkout counter was National Enquirer. It said 25 million readers a week, and he said, whoa, that's better than 7 million a, a month. He thought to himself, I can be featured on the cover of National Enquirer, and I can sell my book. He began to visualize that. On the cover, it would say, secrets of success, motivation, self-esteem, look inside, best book available, change your life, look now. You know, in National Enquirer, they discover everything every week. <laughs> so he began to affirm that. Two weeks go by. He's at Hunter College in New York City. He's doing an all-day seminar on self-esteem. Afterwards, a lady comes from the audience. She says, Jack, do you mind if I interview you? I'm writing an article. He says, no, that's fine. Who do you represent? She said, National Enquirer. His response was, it took you so long to get here. <laughs> she wrote the article, plastered some stuff on the front page, made it 100000 and now Jack makes several hundred thousand dollars a year. His key seminar today is how to become a millionaire. And it's five thousand dollars to go to the seminar. <laughs> I've been totally amazed at how affirmations work. A few of you know me personally in this audience. I was crippled 25 years ago, didn't walk. Affirmations are part of the healing process. Just in planes of old concrete stuff like money. Not to be egotistical, that's not the point. My income last year was about ten times higher than it was four years ago. And it's amazing how the affirmation stuff begins to work. I was out consulting years and years ago, and I'd do something for some corporation. And they'd come to the point saying, well, what do you charge? And I go, oh, I don't know, I'd hem and haw, and I don't know, do you charge $25 an hour or $5,000 an hour? I don't know what the right price is. And I was non-professional, felt uncomfortable. So I began saying to myself, I'm well-educated, I'm well-researched, well-reimbursed, I earn X amount of money, blah, blah, blah. I began saying that over and over again. Within six months, two of my major clients, Fortune 100 companies, they pulled me aside and said, Al, this is kind of off the record. Uh, just want you to know you've been here many times doing workshops. Evaluations are great. People seem to like you. But you need to know of all the consultants we hire, we pay you less than anybody else. Would you mind taking more? <laughs> I said, no, that was fine. <laughs> Honest to God, they doubled what they were paying me without me asking for it. It's amazing what begins to happen when you begin to affirm different things in your life. You might think of an iceberg. Imagine like this thing here is an iceberg. And of course, you know 10% of the iceberg is above the water, 90% is down beneath the surface. 10% of your power is your conscious mind. 90% of your power is down in the subconscious. Let's say, for example, you tell yourself on the conscious level, not going to eat sweets anymore, no more junk food, no more sweets. But your subconscious says, oh, yes, you are. <laughs> You always give in. No, you do. <laughs> subconscious wins every time. If you're a betting person, you bet on the subconscious, not the conscious. So our task is, how do you get all these affirmations you wrote from the conscious into the subconscious so change is easy and automatic? I want to suggest a little step four, five, six step process. The first step in getting affirmations into your subconscious is let your body relax. You did that a few moments ago. Closed your eyes, took some deep breaths, relaxed. Now that's great if you got time. When you do that, you get quicker results. Actually, you can do affirmations anytime. You can do affirmations in the shower in the morning. You can do them driving to work. When you drive to work, I suggest keeping your eyes open. <laughs> you start with letting your body relax. Secondly, is you say your five standard affirmations. And I gave them to you. Like, I love myself unconditionally. I have unconditional love for all people at all times. Now, these are general. I said be specific. These general ones set the foundation for more specific things you want to accomplish. For example, if you love yourself unconditionally, the bottom line is you don't hurt yourself. You don't feed yourself bad foods. You take care of your body, your mind, your spirit. If you have great love for other people, you find yourself perhaps being more supportive of your spouse, more positive. They set the foundation for more specific things you want to accomplish. So you let your body relax, do your five standard affirmations a few times. And those five standard affirmations are crucial. They're in your workbook. I would suggest you use them every day the rest of your life. Thirdly, once you've done your standard affirmations, is you visualize each for a few seconds. It might be you tell yourself four or five times, I love myself unconditionally. After you said that, think of a time when you had great self-esteem. Oh, you felt good about yourself. Put that picture back in your mind. Let that picture nurture your spirit. If you've never felt that way about yourself,
having great self-esteem. Imagine if you were to like yourself a lot, be really successful. Put that picture in the mind. Either one works. Mind can't tell a real picture or a made-up picture. So you say the affirmations, you visualize for a few seconds. Fourthly, you say your own affirmations, one you just talked about a moment ago, ones you're writing down. You say the ones such as, I like myself, or I'm saving money on a regular basis to buy that new house. You say your affirmations a few times. The fifth thing is, after you've said the affirmations, immediately do a pleasure check. See if it feels good to say those things. In other words, do you want those? I said before, define your goal first. If you have a goal such as, or your affirmation such as, I'm an ex-smoker, I enjoy being an ex-smoker, but you love to smoke. You don't want to quit. Only reason you wrote that down is your wife nags you, husband nags you, the kids say, oh, mom, quit smoking, don't do it, dad. They said it's dangerous in school, don't do it. That's their goal, not yours. So after you say the affirmations, it should feel good. I want those things. The sixth step is after you've said the affirmations over and over, you've done your pleasure check, and this is by far the most important part of the process. And that is to do your affirmations, visualizations, three times a day, every day. And I'll be very straight and very honest with you. Affirmations have changed millions of lives, brought tremendous change to lots of people. But they don't work if you don't work them. If you do them today because I talked about it, you try them a couple days later, skip a week, I'll be honest and say, you might as well rip up the workbook and forget the seminar. You will not displace years and years of negative conditioning, the mind binders by a minute here, minute there. It's repetition, repetition, repetition. Three times a day every day, but that's not a big deal. It might be you get up in the morning, you go to your shower, you do your affirmations, your five, 10, 15 affirmations, takes you two, three minutes. That's one time. You get in your car, you drive to work, you say them out loud in the car, you're driving to work. Second time. You drive back home, you say them aloud in the car, third time. Three times a day every day. And the last thing I would suggest, number seven step, is there's different ways you can do them. One is you can do it by talking to yourself. That's what you do when you're closing your eyes. You're talking to yourself quietly. That's what Dwight was doing is up here saying, I'm a great person. Uh, my favorite way of affirmations is driving in the car somewhere. Nobody's with me, and I do them out loud. Yeah, nobody's there. And when I say them out loud, I stay on track. Mine doesn't wander. Or maybe you have a day when the last thing you want to do is affirmations. You're feeling depressed, and you want to feel depressed. The last thing you want to do is affirmations. If you don't feel like doing them, you, you can't skip. So you got to do it anyway. Go to some radio shack and buy yourself a five-minute endless loop cassette tape. Say your affirmations on the tape, same over and over again, fill up the tape. When you don't feel like saying them, stick them in the cassette deck of your car and force yourself to hear them play back to you. They'll work that way. So you can do them talking to yourself. It could be picturing. I mentioned Jack Hanfield drew a picture, $100,000 bill. I mentioned Bruce Jenner had photographs. Or you could just imagine. Now, some of you know Zig Ziglar, of course, great motivational speaker. And he said, I was giving speeches years ago saying, get your life in order, but I was weighing 50 pounds overweight. He said, how did I get up there and say, get your life in order when my life wasn't going too well? So he did the affirmation, I weigh a slim trim, 155, kept saying it over and over again, but he couldn't picture himself weighing that. What he did, went through a bunch of magazine ads and found himself a jockey short ad. He said, I quickly found out they don't put fat boys in those jockey short ads. <laughs> they all look real good. He cut out one of those guys in the underwear, put the guy on his mirror, cut the head off the guy. So picture his own head on top, got a new body image that way. <laughs> could do it that way. Could be the talking to yourself, it could be the picturing, or it could be writing. Then you go to a staff meeting. I don't know. Maybe you sit there sometimes with your agenda and you get bored and you do little stars and triangles and little doodles. <laughs> Total waste of energy. Never make your life better. If you've got extra energy, use it. You could write have the agenda, I am good at, I'm achieving, I'm doing. Write out the affirmations over and over again. It's like the teacher years ago, he had to write in the blackboard 500 times, I'm a good boy, I'm a good boy, I'm a good boy. But most teachers screwed that up, right? He had to write things like, I talk too much, I talk too much, you affirm the negative. So, you do them, those steps, over and over again, talking, writing, picturing, any of those will work. But that brings up a question, how long do you do this stuff? When do you start getting the change, the results, the success? Well, you keep doing the affirmations till you no longer need them. That might be an hour. It may be you're going up for some interview, some job promotion. The hour before the interview, you sit in a quiet spot and you talk to yourself. I'm intelligent, 
I'm capable, I can answer their questions, I'm worthy of this promotion, same for an hour. It may be a whole year. It took Jack Canfield a year to go from $18,000 to $100,000. You do it to you no longer need it. But on the average, 21 days. By 21 days, I mean every single day, not missing a day. You miss one day, got to start the cycle and the process all over again. It's uninterrupted repetition that creates the new mental habit that makes them go from conscious to subconscious. Doesn't mean in 21 days you've lost your 85 pounds. Doesn't mean you've gained a million dollars. But it means you've got your mind believing it. You're doing the right kinds of things. You're moving in the right direction. And what I do to make it real simple, I write mine on a little 4 by 6 index card. I do them by a monthly period. I'll take a look at the end of the month and see which of these have I achieved. If I've achieved it, cross those off the list, add some new ones. Your mind can easily handle 15 affirmations at once. Some will stay in that little card for a month, some for a year, depending on how big the change is. Do it till you no longer need it. Now, 21 days is a weird figure because that's the same time it takes for a voodoo curse to work. <laughs> they don't just point a bone at someone and do a mojo and they drop over dead. <laughs> they give that little comment, praise upon their mind, 21 days later, they drop down. That's how long you do it, but the last question I bring up is, what if you're struggling and doing affirmation? You may be thinking to yourself, ah, I don't feel like this positive thinking stuff. I don't want to do affirmation. I don't feel like it. If you don't feel like doing affirmations, I would suggest immediately stop doing them. Throw them aside and simply tell yourself this. Tell yourself, I thoroughly enjoy doing my affirmations every day and never miss a day. <laughs> you can create an affirmation to want to do the affirmations. But probably most of us want to give it a try. It's a great technology. But people say, I'd like to try it, but I'm so busy. I don't have time to sit and close my eyes and meditate three times a day, or I, I might forget. I said, you can't forget. And people say, I, I don't have the time. I'll give you a simple way where you can't use that excuse, where you never forget, and it takes no time whatsoever. What I would call find triggers. And a trigger is a little event in your daily routine that reminds you when that thing happens, going to do affirmations. A trigger might be whenever I'm driving to work, I'll do affirmations. Whenever I'm stopped at a red light, I'll do affirmations. Whenever I'm walking to the restroom, do affirmations. You're already walking, stopping, or driving, so you waste no time whatsoever. You've got a built-in reminder system. What could be some triggers? Lunch. Yeah, lunch, shower. After you put your kids down, yes, good. Prior to our staff meeting. Prior to a staff meeting, yes, good. On the way to work? Mm hmm. Before bed. Yeah, before bed. Great way to fall asleep doing affirmations. Some people can't sleep because they do mind binders. They lay there in bed, oh, I need sleep tomorrow. If I can't fall asleep, I'm going to be a terrible person on the job. And they start psyching themselves out. Any other mind binder, or other uh, trigger times? Prayers, yeah. The Bible's full of affirmation prayers, like I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's an affirmation prayer. We're going to use the throne. You want to leave alone there anyway? <laughs> <laughs> she said, when you're seated on the throne. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> you thought I just didn't say it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> In fact, the research shows the average person spends three years of their life in the bathroom. <laughs> Whether it's shaving, showering, or just sitting there three years of time, <laughs> it would be great. Well, you know how to write the affirmations. You know how they, in a sense, reprogram the mind for success. You know when to do it. But a couple of cautions at the end. One caution is that you can't write affirmations for things outside physical reality. It has to be physically possible. I can't write an affirmation, for example, that I am the king of England. It's not going to happen. I'm not in line. So it has to be physically possible, but also this is the biggest catch. Like I said, affirmations have changed thousands of lives and careers, perhaps millions. All the athletes do it. But the biggest catch is we'll say this hand starts representing today. This hand is achieving your affirmation, achieving all those changes, all those goals. People come to a seminar, they get excited, they start doing the affirmations, they start making some progress, and they get to a place called neutral or middle ground. Where's she? I lost three pounds. I'm yelling at the kids less. I'm feeling better about my life. I'm relaxing more. 
And that's where most people stop doing their affirmations. And what happens? You always go back to zero. That's why people start diets 50 times or personal programs, improvement programs over and over again. Don't be fooled by progress. Go all the way through to closure. Make sense? The one person I found helpful to wrap these things up, uh -huh. Arthur Gordon. Arthur Gordon today is a very well-known writer, author. But some years ago, Arthur was saying that he had made a number of poor decisions, financial investments, choosing the wrong partners, lost his wife and kids for a while, and decided to commit suicide. Before he killed himself, Arthur said, I will seek the consultation of the greatest psychiatrist in the whole United States. I'll find whoever that prominent person is. I'll give him one session to talk me out of suicide. If he can't do it, I'm finished. It's over. He looked across the country. The best psychiatrist he found was an old man, 85 years of age, New York City, still practicing. He got an appointment. He sat down with the psychiatrist and began to tell him about his problems, his difficulties, his bad moves, bad decisions, problems in business, problems at home. After 20 minutes, the old psychiatrist sat back in his chair. He said, Arthur, that's enough. Over and over again, you keep starting your sentences with the two saddest words in English language. As long as you talk that way, you're never going to get better. Arthur said, well, what do you mean? What are you talking about? So you keep starting your sentences with those words, if only. If only I hadn't made that bad investment. If only I had been nicer to the kids. If only I hadn't done that thing wrong. Psychiatrist said, those words create drag. They pull you down, they face you backwards. Psychiatrist said, if you'd realize how many years I've sat in this chair, close to 60, listening to thousands of patients talk about their problems using those two words, I listen till I get so fed up, I say, if only you'd stop saying if only. <laughs> Might be able to get somewhere. And Arthur said, well, what do you do? So you strike those words from your vocabulary and substitute the two most powerful words next time. So those words create lift, face you towards the future with confidence. My reaction was, wow. Here's the most prominent psychiatrist in the whole United States. Most important thing he learned in 60 years was not some fancy psychiatric theory, but change the way you think. Change the way you talk to yourself from the if-onlys, the mind-binders, to the affirmations of next time. That that's the way you bring about change. That's the way you cope with changes that are pushed upon you. Let's give you one final affirmation. Would you stand up, please? We've talked about the negative conditioning that happens to people. Imagine your back right now is a vulture. And a vulture is a gruesome creature. They like dead flesh. When you tell yourself a negative sentence like, well, I'm no good at this, I can't do that, can't give a speech, can't balance a checkbook, I can't do. When you tell yourself negatives, you're vulturing yourself, creating deadness. Our purpose today is to get rid of those vultures, the deadness. What you do is imagine right now the vultures on your back. You've got his claws in your back, his beak in your neck, waiting for a negative thought. When you think that thought, he takes a bite of your energy, a bite of your self-esteem. I want to get rid of the vulture. Put your arms up like this, please. On the count of three, you'll bring the arms back with a great big punch like that, and the word's going to be, uh. I'm going to punch the vulture in the gut. Ready? One, two, three. Ah, oh, good. Of course, the vulture says, what is this, a tickle contest? One silly seminar doesn't get rid of a whole lifetime of negativity. You've got to be quite firm with the vulture. When those thoughts come, tell the vulture, get off my back. It works. Remember, we said only one sentence at a time in the mind. You tell the sentence, get off my back. Tell the vulture that. Put your arms up, please. Count to three again. With each word, bring back the arms one more time. Ready? One, two, three. Get off my back. Good, good. Of course, the vulture's off your back. He's now flying around looking for a colleague of yours. May come back to you if you're not careful. The way you keep the vultures away is you put in aliveness. Vultures want deadness. And the alive affirmation you can use is the same one teenagers say. If they say it, so can we. We're as good as teenagers, right? And they say, I am awesome. Remember that sentence? <laughs> Put your arms up, please. Lots of pizzazz. One, two, three. I am awesome. Oh, good, good. I was doing that on IBM territory in Washington, D.C. a while ago. I had 500 execs out there in the audience, real conservative types. And I thought, they're not going to do this. I'll make a fool of myself up here by myself. But they're all up there chanting, I am awesome. I finished the program. The vice president came over to me and he said, Al, 
I don't be too critical of your program. But don't our kids say, totally awesome? <laughs> That's right. One last time, please. Put your arms up. One, two, three. I am totally awesome. And you are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.